Hi everyone, this presentation is going to be about hereditary angioedema, past, present and future. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of HAE, where things are at the moment and look at where the future might go. So on to the past. Um, what I would say before getting to these slides uh, is that it may sound a little bit like a history lesson with lots of dates, but I think the key thing to note is the, the sequence of the dates and kind of how things rapidly move on as time moves on. So the earliest description of angioedema was actually in 1586, where a young count was described to have lip swelling and sensitive to eggs. There were then more detailed descriptions in medical literature from the late 1800s, and in 1876, John Laws Milton described something called giant urticaria. Heinrich Quinke in 1882 describes acute circumscribed edema, essentially localized swelling. And, and this has been termed Quinky's edema or angioneurotic edema in the medical literature. 1888 is when hereditary angioedema is first described by someone called William Osler, who is a really famous doctor and, and it's actually been sort of titled the father of modern medicine. He describes an inherited form of angioedema and calls it hereditary angioneurotic edema. Um, and obviously since then, neurotic has been dropped from the label because neurosis is not thought to be part of the cause of the swelling. Um, this is a reproduction of the original article, um, a bit small print, but kind of briefly it on the screen and you can pause to read this if you wish. In, in that article, William Osler essentially describes someone called Mrs. Hedge, who's a 24-year-old lady, uh, admitted to the infirmary for nervous diseases with transient swellings in various parts and colic. There are five generations of affected family members and two family members have actually died of the disease. He also mentions that angioedema has been described by other people at the same time. And I, I think it's actually an impressively accurate description. Uh, bear in mind in 1888, there was no Google, there was no internet, but he was actually pretty aware of what was going on with other doctors at the same time as well. So moving on to 1917, Crowder and Crowder described that HAE is inherited as an autosomal dominant condition, which means that children have a 50% chance, a one in two chance, of inheriting the same condition if they have an affected parent, regardless of whether they are a boy or a girl. In 1961, Li Pao discovers that there's a naturally occurring substance that inhibits C1 esterase. And in 1962, Landerman describes a patient with HAE who has reduced amounts of an inhibitor of calocrine, and he suggests that calocrine could start the formation of edema. And now, moving on to 1963, Donaldson and Evans described three families with no detectable C1 inhibitor levels, whereas unaffected relatives have normal levels, essentially identifying that C1 inhibitor or the absence of C1 inhibitor is what causes hereditary angioedema. In 1986, Davis discovers the gene uh, that results in C1 inhibitor deficiency. And in 1998, Brady Kynan is proposed as the main mediator causing angioedema. Um, it is worth to sort of take note this point of the various substances because at some later stage these is eventually become targets for medicines to treat hereditary angioedema. In 2000, HAE with normal C1 inhibitors described and in 2006, 2017 and 2018 various genes are identified that result in HAE with normal C1 inhibitor. So moving on from the discoveries in hereditary angioedema, we now move on to a timeline of treatments that have been used in HAE. So uh, although HAE is recognized as a condition in 1888, it's not until 1960 that Spalding first tries methyl testosterone as a treatment for HAE. Um, methyl testosterone is an anabolic steroid um, similar to danazole. In 1969, fresh frozen plasma is used for the first time, but there is a risk that this makes the swelling worse. And then in 1972, three different groups try tranexamic acid or something called EACA, which is similar to tranexamic acid. In late 1970s, for the first time, investigators use C1 inhibitor concentrate to essentially replace the thing that's missing in HAE. So you will recognize most of these treatments, but Baronet was actually licensed in Europe from 1979 onwards for acute treatment, i.e. treatment of attacks when they happen. Interestingly, it's only approved in America in 2009. Uh, SINRISE then comes on the scene 
and a trial is done to see whether this can be used to prevent HAE attacks and it's licensed in 2000 in America and 2011 in the EU for prevention of HAE attacks. Um, another treatment called ecalentide, which inhibits calocrine, was approved in America in 2009. Um, this medicine has never been approved in Europe though. So the next development in C1 inhibitor therapy is the development of Riconest, which is licensed in 2010 in the EU and 2014 in America. Um, Baron and Synrise, which are plasma-derived C1 inhibitor products, are essentially sourced from human-donated plasma. And obviously, supply is potentially an issue as this is a finite product. Um, hence, the development of Riconest, which is essentially made from the breast milk of transgenic rabbits and can be generated with less issues on supply limitations. Um, Ikatabant, which again many of you will be familiar with, is a Brady kind antagonist and um, this was licensed in Europe in 2008, designed for subcutaneous administration and, and this again was a stepwise improvement in that it was an effective treatment that could be easily self-administered for acute treatment. And, and this was very helpful because patients could self-administer this um, and, and it's pretty well known that obviously the earlier you give treatment the more effective it is for HAE attacks. So more recently uh, people have focused on better treatments to try and prevent HAE attacks and in 2017 Hegada which is subcutaneous C1 inhibitor was licensed by the FDA. This is not approved in Europe still. Um, more recent to that Lanadilimab, which is this monoclonal antibody against calocrine, was approved in America and in the UK it was approved by NICE in October 2019. There, there are other drugs coming to the market potentially quite soon as well. Uh, BCX7353 um, is an oral medicine that inhibits calocrine. Essentially, they completed a trial in May 2019 for prevention of HE attacks and are currently working to bring this medicine to market. CSL312 is a monoclonal antibody, um, similar type of medication to lanadilimab, and this one targets factor 12A. Um, results of a phase 2 trial were announced in June 2020, and, and this showed quite a lot of promise as well. So this slide is a list of treatments currently in development by various different pharmaceutical companies to try to treat HAE. I'm not going to go through the list, but I think it gives a pretty good picture that there are actually a lot of medications currently being developed to treat HAE. So coming on to the present, um, you can see from the previous slides that a lot has changed in recent history, despite the relatively slow timeline before that. The scientific understanding of HAE is now very well worked out, and because scientists understand what causes the swelling in HAE, it is now possible to target development of various new medications. However, in addition to better medication, there's also a lot more focus now on the quality of life and the burden of illness in people who have HAE, the psychological issues, and as well as how care of people with HAE is organized. So in terms of how care is organized, there have been a proliferation of guidelines. Um, again, this is a long list, but it's, you know, one guideline almost every sort of every other year coming out. And guidelines are good because they allow better standardization of care uh, to promote best practice. And in the UK, we have various commissioning policies that have been released, essentially granting people with HE access to these various modern therapies. So uh, a bit more about the present, treatment has evolved. There's been very much an increased move towards encouraging people to self-administer their HE treatment. This improves the speed of access to treatment, which then increases effectiveness and also removes the need for attendance or removes some of the need for attendance at A&E departments. There has also been a change in the approach to treating attacks in that now in addition to just treating attacks which may affect um, the area of the breeding, there's also a focus on treating attacks that can uh, result in disability and that potentially affect um, a person's ability to work or go to school. Uh, there is more focus and, and work is being start on understanding the psychological effects of the illness. Um, HE registries have also been started to allow pooling of data to better understand a rare condition. And that, that's also been focused on trying to identify people who are yet undiagnosed with their HAE. Um, one, one example of this is a study looking at dry blood spots in people who have unexplained abdominal pain. 
So I, I put up some quotes about the future here just for you to read. So what does the future hold for HAE? Um, I personally think that the future is really quite exciting. There are lots of new medications in the pipeline for starters, and, and we will have a lot more options for treating HAE. In addition to this, there's also a greater focus on other aspects of HAE, for example, the psychological impact of the illness. Um, however, the future also brings challenges. Uh, access to medications is one of them. Uh, for example, access to all these modern HAE medications is not equitable worldwide. You're more likely to have access to these uh, modern therapies if you live in the developed West and, and perhaps less so if you're in a less developed country. Uh, how, how do we address these things? And in, in addition with multiple new medications, how do we treat HAE? Which one do you use first? Which is the best medicine to use? Um, and, and then the final challenge. By and large, at the moment, we tend to wait for someone to have an attack before we actually treat the attack. I, I heard this quote, one, it's not, it quote once, it's not something I came up with, but mentioned in the meeting, essentially saying, why does someone need to wait until they become unwell before having treatment? And, and so the question I'll ask is, will we ever get to the stage where we would generally aim to stop attacks from happening rather than treating them after they have started? And in conclusion, what I would say is that HAE was first described 132 years ago. There has been relatively little progress until the last decade or so and and then things have greatly accelerated as you can see from the slides before there has been a very rapid progress in the last decade and we have come a really long way since 1888 and i think the future really is bright and positive thank you